Welcome back. So, it's the end of our first week talking about objects, and today we're going to continue to introduce some new ideas. We'll do a little bit of review of the stuff that we've already seen. Maybe we'll do a couple problems together. Um, we'll also talk about a, a new uh, feature that we can use to add, um, you know, behavior and state to our objects that works a little bit differently than the behaviors in the state that we've seen uh, so far. All right, so I'm not going to uh, go over the midterm in class yet because there's a couple people that still haven't taken it. Please keep that in mind if you uh, discuss it amongst yourselves or on the forum. But by Monday, everybody should have taken the midterm, and we can talk a little bit about it. The questions will be released on the, the homework for you guys to look at. Um, but in, in general, I was pretty happy with the, the performance of this class on the midterm. Um, we'll talk on Monday more about that and also a little bit about how to interpret your own score as far as, you know, your position in the class going forward. Remember, you know, the, the goal of these assessments, um, particularly in the midterms, but also the quizzes, is not, um, you know, to punish you or to rank you among your peers. It's to make sure that you've learned the material so that you can go on. You know, this is a, a field, this is a skill, this is a discipline that is extremely cumulative. So if you miss out on something in one week, that's going to continue to hurt you going forward. And if you don't have that sort of, those building blocks of, of imperative programming, even though we're talking about objects now, you're going to struggle to, to do some of the work on objects because we're assuming that you know that stuff. And then particularly later when we get into the, the third part of the class and we start talking about more about data structures and algorithms, then you're going to be really in trouble because you need those skills. Um, so that's, that's what the midterm is about. And, and that's the primary purpose of the midterm exam is diagnostic. We want you to understand how you're doing uh, so that you can make choices about sort of what to do uh, going forward. And, and, and also, you know, whether or not the strategies that you're using to prepare for these type of assessments is, are working. Um, if you didn't do very well in the midterm, I would encourage you to, to, to come in um, this afternoon or on Monday, uh, chat with me about it. We can go over your exam together, look at some of the mistakes that you made. Um, one of the things I will promise you is that when you come in, one of the first things I look at is how much time you spent on the practice problems. Because, you know, when people come in and they say, I didn't do well in the midterm, you know, I didn't do well in a quiz, you know, um, what can I do about that? If I see that you haven't spent very much time on those practice problems, that's going to be the first thing I'm going to say. You know, um, this is, you know, when you don't prepare for an assessment, don't expect to do very well. Um, when you do prepare, now if you do prepare, there, there are times when people come in and they say I didn't do very well in the midterm and sometimes they did fine and they're just, you know, a perfectionist, which is fine. Um, other times they didn't do, you know, very well and we might look and find they made a couple of silly mistakes. Um, if that person has done, been doing a lot of work on the practice problems, what I'll say is, you know what, you had a bad, you had a bad hour in the CBDF. That's okay. That, that happens. Um, Probably happen again to you in the future. Maybe you're not a great test taker. That's 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 all right, right? Um, when you do the work to prepare, that is the point. The point isn't to do well in the quiz. The point is to prepare for the quiz. The point isn't to do well in the midterm. The point is to prepare for the midterm. Now, if you prepare for the midterm effectively, you probably will do well a lot of the time. But even if you prepared for the midterm and spent a lot of time working on those problems, practicing them. Um, and then you got to the CBTF and maybe just blanked out a little bit or made some dumb mistakes, that's okay. You know, that preparation that you put in is going to pay off in the future. Okay. So, any questions about midterm stuff before we go on? You know, if you, if you didn't take the midterm, um, I mean, I suspect that everybody in here took the midterm, but if there's, like, somebody out there in the audience who's like, what midterm are we talking about? Um, you know... You can still do that. Please do it, right? You know, I, I, please go in, you know, email the CBTF and be like, you know, I messed up. I need to take the exam. It's, it's still available. I'd much rather you do it um, than, than not do it at all, right? Par partly because of the diagnostic value. You know, it's only really worth 2% of your grades, so maybe you think, whatever, I'll just skip it and, and go forward. Um, but the diagnostic um, value of being able to see where you are and how you're doing and how well prepared you are for the rest of what we're going to do this semester, um, that's really important. Okay, so, last time we started, on, on Monday we introduced objects, and on Wednesday um, we started talking about 
uh, access modifiers. Uh, we also talked about constructors. Just here a little bit of review. So for the, for the stuff we talked about at the end of class, you guys are getting practice with this on this week's homework, which I think is really great. Um, but when we design our new types using Java classes, you know, that are going to allow us to work with new types of data, um, it's frequently useful and helpful to be able to control the access that other code has to your object, particularly to your object's sort of internal state. We can do this in Java using what are called access or visibility modifiers. Um, and we, we looked at two of those last time, public and private. Um, we can apply those both to our instance variables, the object's state or data, we can also apply those to our instance methods, the object's behavior and the way that it implements algorithms associated with the data that it stores. So in this case, I've got a, uh, a person class and I've decided to make the name public. That means that anybody can modify it. Um, that's on line two. I've decided to keep the age in this case private. So that means that only methods defined on that class are allowed to read or write that instance variable. And, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, why would, why would I do this? This doesn't seem to make any sense. Um, and a little bit about sort of the, the patterns that we see in terms of providing access to these through methods, which is something that we'll talk about more today. All right, so, um, you know, variables that are marked, you know, just as a review, variables that are marked public can be modified by anybody who has an instance of that class. So... On line eight, I'm allowed to modify the name of this person instance because that field is marked as public. I'm not allowed to read or write, you know, to access or modify the age field because it's marked as private. One of the reasons that these are sometimes referred to as visibility modifiers is from the perspective of somebody who has an instance of this class, who has an object that is of type person, the age might as well not exist. It's invisible. So when I mark it private, that field now becomes invisible to somebody who has an instance of that, um, invisible to code that's not defined on the class itself. You know, again, so the, the public and private control the visibility of those, those fields. Um, you know, the, from the perspective of the code at the bottom that's using the new instance of, a, of the person class, the age might as well not exist. There's, there's no way to access it. There's no way to modify it um, unless the class provides ways to do that. All right, so I just said this, great. Um, and I can also apply these same visibility modifiers, the same access modifiers to functions. And they, and they work roughly the same way. A public function can be called by anybody. A private function can only be called by other methods or functions defined on that class. So if I have an instance of person here, I can call print it because print it is marked as public. I can't call print you. Print you is marked as private. And this, you know, what, what do we do with this? Well, this is a way to define methods that might be helper methods on your class that are used internally, but that you don't want to expose to the outside world. You don't want somebody else calling that function. That's only for your own, your own use. All right, so great, I just said this. Java provides a couple more of these. We mentioned this. Um, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, we'll talk about protected and, and, and the uh, package private one a little bit later. All right, so this is sort of where we wound up last time. So, you know, we, we talked a little bit about why it, it seems strange. Now, it's not always strange. Sometimes there, there are good um, use cases where I actually want private state for my class that's not visible to anyone, that's only used internally. But it's a very common pattern in Java to essentially do the following. So this is a very, very common pattern. It's so common that, as I pointed out last time, Android Studio can actually generate this code automatically for you. To have a private variable up at the top, and then two public functions. Two is kind of the normal number, but you, you don't have to provide both. Two public functions. One of them is called a setter. The other one is called a getter. By convention, these are named set name of variable in camel case, set age. The setter takes an uh, argument that is the same type 
as the variable that is being set. So my int, my age is an int, it's marked as private, set age takes as an argument an int. And all it does is it sets the age of the private field on that class. And then I also provide a getter. Similar, starts with get, name of the variable, doesn't take any objects, but as a return type, that is the same as the variable that is being retrieved. So in this case, this class is providing a way to both set and get the value of the age. Those methods are public. So notice here that the variable itself is marked as private. So the variable can't be directly accessed by code that has an instance of the person class, but that code can call set age and get age and those public methods that are visible to it and are available to it do the same thing. They set the age or return the current age of the object. Anyone remember why would we want to do this? So again, this seems like a lot of extra work in order to do something that I could already do. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the, the reason to do this is because it provides the class with a lot more power and control over how the age is modified. If I make the age public, anybody can change it whenever, I, whenever they want, and I don't know anything about it. So by providing, particularly a setter, by providing a setter, it means that whenever you want to change the value of age, you have to run code that's provided by this class. And that code can do all sorts of things. It can check to make sure that the age is valid. It can, maybe I need to update other variables that are also part of the class in response to the change in the age. Um, so there's a variety of different things that I can now do um, in response to this because I can put whatever code I want here. So this is, a, this is sort of like the simplest possible getter and setter, but this isn't required. I can put more code in my set age method that can do whatever I want, right? That can, that can check things. Um, when you guys start working on MP2 next week, there are three pieces of state associated with the game that are all related to each other. And so anytime you make a change to one, you're gonna have to check the other two as well. This is another common thing that we might do. Yeah. Yeah, you can, the, the, this dot, as, as we talked about before, is simply to make this a little bit more clear what variable I'm accessing. But a, this is a great question, so another good piece of review. So if I modified this and I just had age is equal to set age, would this still work? Yeah, because w what happens when the compiler tries to figure out, you know, what age variable are you, return are you referring to? So it's gonna look, is there, a, is there a, a private, is there a local variable here called age that's defined inside the function? No. Is there a parameter to the function that's called age? No, there's a parameter called set age. So now it goes up to the class and it says, oh, okay, so there's a private um, instance variable here called age. That's what's going to be changed. There was a question over here. Maybe that question went away. Um, yeah. Where? Could I call the parameter age? So I, I could do that. That's confusing, right? So the question is, could I take the variable that's a parameter to my setter here and call it age? I could. Then I would have to use this dot here because I'd have to be clear that I'm referring to the instance variable called age as opposed to the parameter called age. If I took off this dot, what would that read? It would read age is equal to age and then the compiler doesn't know which variable I'm talking about. Typically, my convention is to not name those variables the same as the, the variables, because this, cause, this causes confusion. It's a great question. Yeah. What's that? It will, yeah. Yeah. Good question, okay. So, th so here's the example that we looked at last time where essentially I'm using so now, now I have this capability, which is I can run code. I can also uh, connect one variable to other variables. So here was the example we looked at where I'm, I have a person class, and I'm allowing you to set the entire name at once, 
but I still want to extract the components of the name, the first name and the last name. Now again, this is a much harder problem than this piece of code makes it look like. Because some of you have three names and four names, and so if I just take your name and break it on white space, I might get two, three, four, five different parts, and I've got to kind of sort out what's what. Um, but in, you know, at least in this country, the common case where I have two names, a first name and a last name separated by white space, this will work. And when I set the name, what it does is it actually runs some code, right? So there's, there's more than just an assignment inside my setter. My setter is actually doing a bunch of work, right? And when it's done on line seven through nine, it's setting three variables on this class. So this class maintains a first name, last name, and the full name, and I actually have getters for all three of them. But I only have a setter for the name, because the name also changes the first name and the last name. So this is another thing that I can do using setters and getters. Yeah? I know, I forgot to, I forgot to fix this, that should be a string bad professor. I saw this last time, and, and here it is again, and I see it again, and I'm probably going to forget to change it again. But I won't have to be embarrassed by this again until next fall, so that's okay. Um, yeah, the parameter to set name should be a string, not an int. Just a cut, cut, cut and paste mistake on my part. All right, so let's do an example here um, using some of the things that, that we've learned so far. So, what we're going to do is we're going to design a storage class. Uh, I've, I've sort of stuck a little bit of uh, a template to get started at the top. This class, what it does is it's going to allow us to store a couple of ints. And the number of ints that we store in this class is something that we're going to choose when we create an instance of it. And then we're going to provide um, setters and getters and maybe just like a, maybe an add function that adds a new int uh, to, this, uh, to this storage class, right? All right, so the first thing let's do, so I, I put in here, so here's an example of a class that has some private state. So this storage class is going to store some number of integers. And so I know internally, now this is a private variable, so it's not visible to the outside world, but the class has to remember what those integers are. This is what it's supposed to do. And so I know that I need an array of ints. I'm going to declare that private, um, and then I'm going to provide methods for um, someone who has an instance of this storage class to use that modify this, um, that add, and this is how I'm going to store the values that have been added to this storage class. Why don't I initialize this here? So, so I could initialize this right here. I could say, um, you know, using our array initializer Syntax, new int, let's say 10. Why, why am I not doing that? Yeah. Yeah, I want, I want to allow the size to be set when I create a new instance of storage. So where am I going to do this? I'm not going to do it here. What do I need? What's, what's, what, what, let, let's start implementing our storage class. What's the, one of the first things I need to provide here? Yeah. Well, in order to when, when I create a new instance of storage, I can create a new instance of storage right now. Let's do that. So let's say um, storage, oops. So this is already going to work, right? So that compiled a RAND, didn't print anything, but that's okay. But what do I need to know when I create an instance of my storage class? Yeah, in the back. Size. So how am I going to do this? Yeah. I need to provide a constructor for my storage class, exactly. So what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to say something like this. Um, now if I try this now, it's going to say, there's no constructor defined that takes an int, because I haven't created one yet. Remember, if I don't provide a constructor, I get a default constructor for the class that takes no arguments. But what I need to do here is I need to provide my own constructor. So 
Who can remind me how to create a constructor for a class? What is it? How do I do this? What's the name of the function? Yeah, David. Yep, so we're going to call this storage, exactly. I don't declare a return type because I don't need to. Constructors always return a new instance of the object. What arguments is this constructor going to take? Somebody who hasn't contributed yet today. Yeah. Yeah, an int, like the size of the, of, of the um, so we'll call this set size. Okay, so, so now this will work, but what am I going to do with the size variable? What's being passed to the constructor is the size of this storage object, the number of ints that I want to allow it to hold. So what should I do with that information? Currently, I've got an array called storage that's sitting there waiting for me to use it, but what do I need to do before I can do that? Somebody who hasn't contributed yet today. Yeah. Exactly. So I need to initial, I'm going to initialize my array. Oh, yeah, I need to do this properly. Okay, there we go. So for, for now, let's make this public. Because what that's going to do is allow me to check to make sure that this worked. So I'm going to do first.storage.length. And this should, if I, if I did my job right, create print 8. Let's say if I print 16, that seems to work. Okay, so now I'm successfully initializing the array that I'm going to use. So at this point, I, I could allow this array to be public. Um, and then people could add and remove elements to it just using index notation. But what I actually want to do is I want to provide an add function. So let's call this the public void add. That function is going to take a new value. And I want to use this to add a new value to my, the, the values that I'm storing. Okay? Now let me... Uh, mark my storage class as private, my storage, uh, my array of ints as private again. Okay, so this code down here is going to fail. Um, that's fine. All right, what am I going to do here? I guess the first question is like, what, what are the, well, how do we want this to work? Who can describe more clearly? Because I've been, I've been somewhat vague about this, right? how this is going to work. Who can try to give me a, a more clear explanation, and it's up to you, right, about how this class should work. So it's going to store, you know, it's set up now to store 16 integer values. But, but how, how should this work? I have some decisions I need to make here about exactly how I'm going to design this. You can, you, can, you can think of those decisions in, in terms of, like, how do I actually implement this add function? So now I have, again, I have my storage class set up properly with enough space to hold, in this case, 16 integers, but that's a parameter that I, that I use when I create the class. But let's talk through how to do add. Okay, so I've got the new value that I want to store. What do I need, like, what are some things I need to think about here? Yeah. Yeah, so that's, so, so, but, but what question are you answering here? That's, that's not a bad strategy. But what do I not know here in my add function? Yeah. Where should I put this value? So, so here, let, let me, uh, let me write a, a really kind of silly version of add. Um, storage zero is equal to new value. So that'll work. What's wrong with this? Why does this feel a little dumb? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, how many values can this storage class store? One. Because every time I call add, I just put it at the front of the array. And so in this case, I've got 
15 spots in this array that aren't being used for anything, right? So I might as well just have this store one value, at which point it's like I've created a fancy wrapper around the int primitive type, which seems like kind of a waste of time. So yeah, I need to know where to put this, okay? So the suggestion was, and I think this is, this is perfectly fine. Um, so let's create a new uh, private variable. And here I'm just gonna initialize this right where I declare it. So this is current location. That's the spot where I'm gonna store the value that's being added to the, uh, to my class. So now let's go down here and we'll say current location is equal to new value. Okay, that's great. What else do I need to do? So, so far, this isn't that big of an improvement because current location is always gonna be zero. Every time I add a value, I also need to do what? Someone who hasn't participated yet today. Right now, this is just gonna stay put, but you know, at least the first few times, yeah. Yeah, let's increment our current location so that we move on to the next value. Good. Okay, so this works a few times. Let's, let's, let's try this. Um, let's make a, I'm gonna get a small one here, right? Um, okay, so this, this I think is going to work. Let's see what happens, okay. I'm gonna do first dot add. Oh, now I have a problem. What happened? I was fine, kind of. My array's too short. Yeah, so I created a storage class to store two ints. So I was able to add one on line 15 and then one on line 16. But when I got to line 17, it's full. So what should I do here? This is another place where we have a choice to make. How would you guys like this to work? There's a couple of different options. Once, so at some point, no matter how many values I set up my storage class to store, I'm gonna run out. And the question is, what do I do now? Yeah. Let's not make it bigger. That's a great question. So the question is, I could expand, right? But no, let's not do that. Let's say this is a, has a, it's gonna store a fixed number of values. But I still have a choice to make when I add a new value. What is that? Yeah. Yeah, I could try to signal in some way. I, I can't, I, I could change add to return like an int or something like that. Yeah, so, so that, let's come back to this, right? So I could fail, which I like that. So the question, the, the, the idea here is that once the storage class is full, I should just fail. I should indicate that the new value wasn't added because the storage class doesn't have any more space. How do I do that? I wouldn't say return a string, but we're on the right track here. What do I need to do in order to enable this? So right now I call add and what do I need, what does add need to do for me? It's gotta help me out a little bit here. Need to make a change. Someone who hasn't spoken up yet. Is that a sign? I need to make a change here to one of my functions. Yeah. Well, okay, let's, hold, let's, let's get there. So obviously I need to check in my add function to see if I have any more space, but what does add have to do that it doesn't do right now? Right now I call add, and what do I get back from it? Nothing. So how do I need to change add so that I know when the array is full? Yeah. It's gotta return something, right? What do you guys, what do you guys think? How, how should we do this? It could return a string. It's maybe a little bit more useful to a human than to a computer. What would be a good value here to return? Yeah, an int has too much. What do I care about? What can add tell me? I call add and I say, I wanna put this value into the storage class. 
what can add return to tell me something about what happened? There's essentially two outcomes here, right? What are the two outcomes? If there's enough space, the value can be stored. If there isn't enough space, it can't be. So what type can store two values? Boolean. So why don't we have add return a Boolean that tells me whether or not the add succeeded or failed. So now I've got to make some changes here to my add function as somebody suggested. So what I'm going to say is if current location is greater than or equal to uh, storage storage dot length I'm going to return false otherwise I'm going to add it increment the current location and return true so now what you see is that I'm actually going to this is not going to fail anymore because I'm avoiding my array out of bounds exception. And if I put some print statements in here to see what the add function is telling me, I should get true, true, false. Good. Okay, we're making some progress here, but I'm skeptical of one thing. So there's one thing that you haven't proved to me so far in terms of how we've done this. The add method works, I guess, right? But here, let me give you a, a, a version of add that works the same way. So if I run this, it's gonna work great. Look at that, same, same result. What's wrong with this? What does this version of add not do? like store the value, right? Here, let me give you another version that doesn't work. You know, maybe I made some silly mistake, maybe I set this to zero, I don't know. This also works, as far as we can tell. So I want to make sure that this is actually storing the values that I have put into it. How do you guys suggest I do that? Let's, let's verify our solution. Let's try to find a way to make sure that our solution is doing the right thing. How do you guys suggest that we do this? It's sort of a debugging task. Any ideas? Yeah, in the back. Compare the new array with the old array. Yeah, but then, I, so, so what, what do I, what would I really like to, what should this class be able to do? If it's working properly, and I've added 10 values and the size is 20, what should it, what should it know? What should it be able to tell me? Yeah. Yeah. So why don't we write a little helper function down here called print values. And here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna say for n is equal to zero, i is less than current location, i plus plus. I'm just gonna print one on each line, the values in my little storage class. So now down here, I'll call first.print values and use this to make sure, uh-oh, so now I can see something's wrong because I've added two and three, and what's wrong is that I forgot to fix this little bug that I introduced into the class. Okay. So now let's test some other values. It looks like it's working properly. After I add a value that's off the end of the array, what do I expect to happen? I expect it to be unchanged. So that's something else that I would want to test is if I add a value after the storage class is already full, it shouldn't change the values that are already there. And there are ways to um, you know, implement add that are wrong that will cause that to, to cause that problem. All right, so now if I change this to four, what do I expect to happen? Okay, the first time it has 
Two values, second element is three values, so this seems to be working okay. Questions about this example? This gives us, you know, a, a couple, this brings together a couple things we've talked about. We have a constructor that does some initialization. Um, we have a class method. Sorry, we have, a, we have an instance method called add. Add is sort of a setter. It's not called set storage, but it's, it's acting like a setter. It's allowing me to, to, to set something about the class. And then I've created a little helper function to print it back. One thing that, that, that tends to confuse people when you start talking about and working with objects is that every object has its own state. Behaviors are shared among objects, but they always operate on that object's internal state. So, if I create a new storage object here called second, and let's make that size eight, and down here, let's add to second, let's put a little divider in between here so we can see the difference. All right. So, I now have two separate storage objects. The first one, which I'm calling first, was set up to store four values. The second one, which I'm calling second, was set up to store eight values. And they're completely independent from each other. Those two arrays that they're maintaining are totally separate. They have the same name in the class, but I have two instances of this class. So when I call first.add, I'm adding to my first instance of the class. So it now stores those two values. When I call second.add, I'm adding to the second instance. So these are totally separate. They don't, they don't share any information. Okay, questions about this? Before we go on. I think I had something. Or questions about access modifiers in general. Give you guys a little bit more practice with this, of course, uh, particularly on the next step P. Okay, so. Having told you, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, so if, when, when we start doing problems that use access modifiers, we will tell you, you know, um, your class should provide a public method called this. Private methods are typically up to you. So, so it's a great question. When we give you guys homework and quiz questions about, how, about object design, we will tell you the, uh, the public methods that we expect you to provide us. You are welcome to implement your own private variables and your own private methods internally. We don't test those. Um, but we'll say, you know, this object should provide, like the, the ones you guys have done the last couple days, you know, this object should provide a method called flop or something like that. That's a public method that we can call when we test it. And we'll tell you how that works. Internally, what your class does is up to you. So you may have implemented that using a variety of different private methods, and that's or private variables or private methods, and that's totally fine. Right? All we do is we test the public methods that your class provides. Okay. So, given that it's Friday, um, let me scramble your brain a little bit. Um, because that way it can be scrambled over the weekend. So I just told you that objects each maintain their own state. So our storage class, every object had its own internal array where it was using, that it was using to store ints. Now let me tell you how to make that not true. And I want to warn you about this. So we're going to talk about this, because we're going to do homework problems on it, but I... After a couple semesters of teaching the class, I think this is probably one of the most um, confusing and complicated things um, that, we, that we talk about this semester. This really tends to, to, to confuse people. Um, and that's why we're talking about it 10 minutes before class ends on Friday. It's a perfect time to talk about confusing stuff. So, um, so static. This is another keyword. You're going to see it. And I want to tell you a little bit about what it does. Okay? So. When I put static in front of a method, or I put static in front of a variable, so you can see on line two, public int count, that looks familiar to us. That means that my course class has a variable called count. And every class, every instance of the course has its own count variable. But 
when I stick static on it, now that changes. Now there is only one count variable that is shared among all instances of the course class. The same thing is true for methods. So a static method cannot use instance variables. There's only one static method that's shared among all instances of a class. So this is very, static methods are very common. And they're very common in Java because let's say I want to provide a method that does something that isn't really attached to an object state. So there's certain times where I want to provide like a mathematical function or something like that that doesn't really need any object state. It's just an algorithm, and I provide all the inputs as parameters to the function. In that case, a lot of times what you'll find, so has, has anybody used the math library to solve any of our problems? Uh, maybe some of the homework problems or whatever, yeah. So math is a library you can use in Java, and math provides a bunch of static methods. Because, for example, if I'm computing the absolute value of something, I don't need an object to do that. I just give you a number and you return a result. So static methods are pretty common. Um, a static method um, can be called without an instance of the class. So that's the other thing that I can do here. So you'll see I have a static method in my example class. Main is always static. And you'll see on line nine some new terminology here. So, we, th so this is weird. You've never seen this before. What do I have? I have a, the name of a class, the name of a type, my new type called course, and then dot notation, and then a method name. I can't do this with an instance method. I can only do it with a class method or a static method. So I can call print name without, before I create an instance of course. I can also call static methods given an instance of the class that they're defined on. So the line of code on line 12 also works. So now, on line 11, I'm creating a new instance of my course class, or my course uh, object type, um, that variable I'm calling CS125, and I can still call this print name function that's, that's a static function. Okay? So static methods, you know, you're, you're going to see, and they are used, they're defined directly on the class, they don't belong to an instance, um, but they can also be called on an instance as well. Here's the thing, so because I can call them without an instance, I'm sorry, I keep using the wrong laser pointer. So on, because this code on line nine works, a static method cannot access instance variables. We'll show you some examples of that either today or on Monday, okay? So they can't call this. They can't use this, and they can't use any variables that are defined as instance variables. So for example, um, my static function here, print name, so I ha here I have an instance variable called name. Every instance of the course has a name. But a static function can't access an instance variable. It can't use this, and even if I took this out, it still wouldn't be able to use name. Because I can call the static function without an instance. Stat okay, so, he so here's, I, I really feel like there should be like a big, I should have fixed this, there should be like a big red border around this slide. Static variables are almost never useful. They are almost never useful. You will almost never need to use a static variable. I'm saying this because one of the ways that people will get a bunch of questions wrong on quizzes and on some of our homework is that for some reason they'll put a static on the variable, declaration. And then very weird things will start to happen. Wrong things, right? Um, I think sometimes, uh, you know, uh, people when they're fiddling around, they think, oh, it didn't work, and so I'll put static on it and see if that helps, right? Um, you almost never, ever, ever need to use a static variable. But a static variable is shared by every single instance of an object. So for example, down here on line nine and 10, I'm creating two different courses. And then I'm incrementing the a static variable. Now note that I don't have an instance of the course. I have the class. Again, I'm using the class name and then dot notation and I'm doing count plus plus. This is a class variable. It's associated with the class, not with the particular instance. Then if I call print count, um, that will print the same value for both classes. I hope I have an example of this. Good, I do, okay. 
So here's my course class. I have this static count variable. And you'll see that when I change it, so let me put a couple of these up here. Okay, so I've created two new instances of course. 15 and 16, I print the value of count. It's zero for both. Now, I call course.count, and there's only one value of that count that's shared by everybody. And so, when I get down to line 18 and 19, they both see the change, right? So they both print one. If I make this, I can set this to like 10 or eight, they both see eight. If this is not a static variable, so let's, let's do this, actually. And actually, let's do this. This is, this is fun, okay? So now, every instance, of course, has its own count. So what's going to happen here? So I'm going to uh, print the counts at the beginning. Those are going to print zero. And then I'm calling cs125.count. I'm setting that to eight. And now you can see down here, it's hard to see. Let me set this to something bigger so it's a little bit more obvious. Now you can see that only the count associated with the CS125 course instance has changed. So again, a tiny little change to my class declaration and hugely different behavior. So now everybody sees the change. Now only the instance that I changed it on sees the change. This is confusing, I understand, but also my advice is very simple. Don't create static variables. You'll just almost never need them. I think there's like one you, you're, you're supposed to create on MP2, but we will be very specific about which one it is and why we're doing that. In general, on the homework problems and other places, it's almost, unless we tell you very explicitly, it's almost never the right thing to do. In fact, I don't think there's a single homework problem or quiz question where we don't tell you to use a static variable that you need to use a static variable. It's almost always wrong. Right? And, and again, it, it creates these really strange um, problems that can be very hard to debug. Because now, let me go back and change it to static again. So now, every instance of your class is sharing this one variable. So how about we do this, actually? Let's, let's make this into a little example. Let's call this enrollment. Right? So now imagine that I'm trying to use this to store how many students are enrolled in each class. And again, I, I, I messed up, and I made this static. And so when I change the enrollment of CS125, I've now changed the enrollment of every single class. And even if I created eight other class instances here, they would all change. So again, the right thing here, because the enrollment is going to be specific to every instance of a class, is to have this be an instance variable. And that's almost always the right thing to do. Okay. Just quickly before we finish, static, private also work the way that you would think they should on static, sorry, public and private also work on static variables and methods. Public, a static variable can be read or written by anyone. Private, only read or written by methods defined on the class. Same thing is true for uh, methods. Public static methods can be called by anybody. Private static methods can only be called by other methods on that class. Okay, we'll come back and, and start with this example on Monday. So I'm going to, um, you guys have MP1 due on Monday. Good luck finishing that up. We have office hours all day today, all weekend, and all day Monday, obviously. I have office hours today from 1 to 3 in my office. Um, if you guys have feedback you want to share about the class, there's a link here. We do read that, and I will respond to a lot of it on the forum, and we will think about it and use it this semester and in future semesters to try to make the class better. So have a great weekend. I'll see you guys on Monday.